Welcome to the INSEAD Global AI Leader Series. I'm Theo Evgenio, professor at INSEAD, and I'll be your host for this series. Before diving into the recording of the first event of the series, I'd like to share some thoughts about the rationale behind the structure of the series. As AI is slowly transforming the way we live, get information, make decisions, but also compete between companies, but also between nations. It's important we all understand different aspects of this powerful technology and its implications for our world. That's why the series is structured to cover topics ranging from the scientific and technological foundations of this powerful technology to the business as well as policy implications. Moreover, given the different possible views of this technology and its implications around the world, we gathered a group of experts from different parts of the world, from China, Europe, Israel, Singapore, UAE, and US. Please remember that for you to attend the series, you need to register for every event separately. I'm sharing with you here how to do this. This is, for example, the registration event that you registered for the first event. If you scroll down on this website, you will see the other events, another seven, a total eight, for which if you click on each of them, for example, the second one, you can register for them separately. Let me start with the structure of the series and share with you the schedule. We start with the first event, which is this recording, where we focus on the foundations, scientific and technological, of AI, with Amnon Sashua, professor at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, founder, CEO, and chair of Mobili, AI21 Labs, Orcam, and Mendy Robotics, and with Tommy Poggio, professor at MIT, and member of the leadership team of the MIT Quest for Intelligence Initiative. Before proceeding, I'd like to spend some time outlining some of the technical terms that you may hear about during the first recording. For those of you who are familiar with technical terms of AI, you can skip this part and go directly to the recording. One of the surprising and very important discoveries, if one may say, in AI the past few years is what's called embeddings. Embeddings are vector representations, sequences of numbers, that can be used to represent, for example, words. For example, here you see each of those words, the movie was terribly exciting, being represented as a vector, a list of, in this case, let's say four numbers, these red dots, which can be numbers. But in practice, this can be thousands or more numbers per word. One of the surprising findings in AI in the past few years has been that if we represent language, words, tokens, as we say, as vectors of numbers, and we then do mathematical operations with these vectors, algebra, matrix multiplications, matrix operations, we can then manage to get AI to understand language and generate language. This has been a major surprise that nobody expected a few years ago. The fact that language and maybe human thought can be represented with vectors and can be generated using mathematical operations. We will also discuss during the first event about different architectures, architectures of deep learning, of neural networks, architectures being how we organize the different mathematical operations, how we organize what is the process of doing these operations. For example, we'll discuss about transformers, transformers being a deep learning architecture that is used behind most large language models today, if not all. Transformers, as you will hear in the first event, consist of two key components, among others. One is the multi-layer perceptron, what's called here fit forward, which basically does a number of mathematical operations, including, as you see down here, metrics and vector operations and multiplications. And the other is, the attention unit. The attention unit also does, of course, mathematical operations of matrices, matrices corresponding some of them to the embeddings I mentioned before, but also other internal representation. It's called attention because, for example, when it comes to generating the next word during a translation task or during a text generation task, the next word is generated based also on what were the most recent words. The words where the AI has to pay attention to and generate the next word based on those. It's a little bit like when we are reading and we want to understand a word what it means or we want to understand a sentence what it means. We don't need to remember the whole book for this necessarily, but we can only focus on the recent text or the text around the word we're reading. 
That's the attention unit. And it has been proposed in the framework of Transformers with a very famous paper by Google researchers back in 2017, attention is all you need. One other important concept we will discuss is the sequence to sequence. Sequence to sequence is a more advanced, if you like, machine learning um, framework. Traditionally, machine learning and AI, much like other statistical methodologies, have been about trying to predict what an output, let's say a letter Y, is given a number of inputs, let's say X. The output can be, for example, whether somebody will default on the loan or, or whether somebody will buy a product or how likely it is for somebody to buy a product or at what price. The input can be characteristics of the person or actions the person may have done in the past, like what website somebody saw, what like somebody made, etc., etc. And the idea is to find a function, a mathematical equation that takes as input the X, the characteristics of the person, and predicts the Y the action of the person or whether the person will default. Sequence to sequence is a generalization of this. In this case, the output Y can be a sequence, for example, a sequence of words, which makes a sentence or a text, and so can be the input. So in that case, using a sequence input, like in this case, a sequence of words, in this case, a translation task from French to English, as you see, the idea is to generate another sequence as an output which in this case is a translation in English. And that's sequence to sequence. The length of the sequences, of course, can be large. This is a concept that, as we'll discuss later, is important. We will also talk about chain of thought, which is one type of prompt engineering, which we may have heard already about. Chain of thought is the idea that if you help large language models, they may give you better answers. For example, if you give an example of how to reason, how to go from step by step, as you see this extra blue highlighted text in the second case, chain of thought is on the right, standard prompting is on the left. Then by giving the LLM an example of how to reason for a similar problem and then asking the LLM for a new question, a new problem, you are helping the LLM to actually find a better answer to the new problem. In fact, the correct answer. The difference between the left and the right is only that in the left side, we give an example, example question, example mathematical problem in this case, we give an answer, and then we ask LLM to give us the answer to a new, a new question. In the right, we do the same, but we also teach the LLM how to reason step by step. And this improves performance. It's a chain of thought, step by step thinking. Finally, you will hear about overfitting and about memorization, memorization of big data potentially. Overfitting is a very fundamental concept in machine learning. It means that when we're given a number of data, for example, as you see in the top right, in the top plot, the dots, the dots relating time in this case, for example, or in general, an X to a Y, X axis to Y, back to what we said before, the X being the input, the Y being the output. The question is, can we find a function, a mathematical function that we can use for a new X, which is not available here? For example, if you take this function here in the middle, if I get a new x here, there is no y for this one. There is no dot. We don't touch, every, we don't touch anything. We can predict the y given by the curve that we have here, the line. So the goal here is to find a function that we can use for new x's to predict the y. Now, there can be many functions one can develop. For example, on the very left, you see a straight line. It's not a very good fit to the data. It's underfitting, as we say. Then on the very right, you see another curve, which is going exactly through every single data point in our training data, in our examples, which is called overfitting. Overfitting is known to be potentially an issue. In fact, one of the fundamental theorems in machine learning, in so-called statistical learning theory, is that as we increase the complexity of the function we fit, so for example, the rightmost function, the line, is a lot more complex, clearly, than the previous two, and as we decrease the error we make from the data by doing so with a complex function, of course, over time, over as we increase the complexity, the training risk, the training error, the error we make on the data, the error we make on the training data keeps going down. But the error in the test data, so-called test risk, which is the error AI will make when it's used, 
not when it's trained, but when it's used. When we overfit, the, the use error, the test error of AI will go up. So basically, a good AI model should not be very simple, should not underfit like this line, but should also not overfit like the right line. It should be simple, but not too simple. To paraphrase a quote that is often attributed to Einstein, keep it simple, but not too simple. Now, it turns out that a mystery of deep learning is that overfitting, which is also in a sense memorization, because this line memorizes what are the answers to a specific axis, actually does not necessarily lead to poor performance when AI is used. As you see here, when we create way much larger AI models, for example, with a trillion parameters, like GPT-4, or with 80 billion or 8 billion or 10 billion parameters, you hear all those large language models having, you know, 70 billion, 10 billion, 7 billion. This is how complex, in a sense, the equation is. How far we are from the left to the right in this plot, on the top plot. It turns out that for deep learning, overfitting, even though we have a training error which is zero, does not necessarily hurt performance of the AI in testing, in use, which is, has been a bit of a mathematical mystery given the foundational theorem I just mentioned before. Of course, by now we understand quite a bit about why this happens, but not all. We still have a lot of mysteries about why, when, and how deep learning works. So you will hear about memorization and overfitting being bad in traditional AI, but not necessarily bad in the new AI, where we are using deep learning networks with billions and trillions of parameters, very complex functions, but also with a lot of big data for training. Let me just end by saying that um, for those of you interested, I have discussed a number of those concepts plus more in a short article I recently wrote uh, and posted on my LinkedIn profile, which is uh, has a title, A Very Brief History of AI. I welcome you to take a look at it. Finally, before going to the recording, I'd like to suggest that as you watch the recording of the first event, you keep in mind a few questions, which perhaps you may want to take a screenshot of. We'll come back at the end of the recording, and I'll share with you some thoughts based on the first event about these specific questions. For example, think about as you watch the, the, the event, the following questions. What are the main surprises in our AI journey and why are these surprising? How far can big data take us? Is there a wall we may, be we may be hitting with just data given today's AI architectures like transformers and theories? Are we really in a big data world or are we still in a tiny data world? And what does that mean? Are sequence-to-sequence -sequence AI models enough to build AI reasoning? How about abstraction? What's the difference between reasoning and abstract, abstract, abstraction? Notice a comment made during the event about how today's large language models achieve an impressive, in quotes, 68% score in math tests, in high school math tests. This seems surprising, and it was surprising to many of us. However, is it potentially also an indication that only 68% and not 100% indicates that today's AI has some fundamental limitations, some fundamental walls that we are potentially hitting. Consider also what it means to become a scientist. What's the relation between science and abstraction? And what can we do when AI achieves this, if AI achieves these scientific capabilities? We will then discuss, of course, and see various topics around business. For example, the economics of LLMs and whether we can make we have made them to work today you'll see some links between understanding science and engineering understanding what's possible from a scientific and engineering point of view and then bringing it to production making the economics work and see the link between science engineering production business operations and economics highlighting the importance of being able to understand something about all those different topics around ai We'll discuss about product platforms for AI industries, for the AI world. What is universal that can be used across many products and what is customizable? How can we build 
AI systems and products and services which have their own behavior, their own personalities, their own values, yet being built on a common underlying platform. We'll talk about this when it comes to autonomous driving with driving experience, for example. Different types of driving experience, different behaviors of the cars. Finally, a question I suggest you think throughout the whole webinar is the following. What are the fundamental forces driving AI today? And what are some breakthroughs we may have to make next? Where may this take us and when? What's possible today? What's not possible today? and what may or may not become possible in the near or far future. I hope you enjoy the webinar, and I'll come back at the end of the recording to share some reflections. Thank you.